So I've got two major reviews going on, okay? Because tonight's lesson is pretty easy. The next two weeks, which probably will take longer than two weeks, um, are, are a little bit more difficult. All right, so let's start right now with the timeline, which is up here, okay? And what we know so far, okay? And what I'm doing now is I'm combining we're, we are combining all the different things that we've learned out of Daniel and we're putting it on a timeline we know about this. Of course, Daniel was taken as an exile into Babylon and he received visions and so forth. And eventually Babylon was overtaken by Persia and Cyrus gave the decree, right, mm -hmm. for the Jews, the exiles, to go free, to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. But remember also mm -hmm. that um, that was prophesied long ago, but Daniel received a, a vision in that Persian Empire, you know, that it was going to be seven weeks plus 62 weeks, right? Things would happen within that time frame. You add that up and you get 69 weeks. And at that point is when the Messiah, the Prince, would be made manifest. And we figured out that was at the baptism, right? Mm -hmm. And he came up out of the waters, Jesus did, anointed, and then he didn't go straight to the cross. What did he do? He went and he ministered a confirming ministry for three and a half years which is the half week of the 70th week, because we know that what was given to Daniel was that there's 70 weeks of completion for everything to get fixed, everything to come, be come to completion is gonna take 70 weeks. Remember, there's those six clauses, and of course we know that they were judicially taken care of here, but that wasn't the end of 70 weeks. They haven't been carried out. The sentences have been stated, or the sentences haven't been carried out, okay? So um, judgment has been made at the cross, and spiritually for us, judicially, but it's, it's got to get carried out over here when Jesus returns. And when Jesus returns, it's going to be the 70 weeks. So it makes it all, all the sense. All right. So we see all of this stuff. Now, um, granted, before Messiah came, we know that the Grecian kingdom took over from the Persian kingdom, and then the Roman took over from the Grecian, and Messiah was born into the Roman kingdom, you know, yada, yada, yada. We have the cross. And then we know that in AD 70, when Jesus cried, it is finished, that was the end of Judaism. That was the end of Torah-based Judaism. But we know that some of the Jews, many of the Jews, they insisted on keeping Judaism alive. And what were they doing? They were doing the abomination of desolation by sacrificing in the temple, right? Well, in AD 70, okay, about 40 years after the cross, which is in AD 30, Titus came of the Roman armies, he was the prince, he came and he desolated all of that, that which was prophesied, right? Mm -hmm. So what, is hap what happens 20 years later? John, the baby disciple, he is now an old man and he's exiled on the Isle of Patmos. It's a type of persecution for his testimony, okay? And what does he receive from the Lord? The Revelation. Book of Revelation. And it's really important because for end times, the twin volumes that tell us about the end times are the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. They go together. But see, up until 80, 90, we didn't even have the book of Revelation, of course. But now, you know, we do. So that was in 80, 90. And we're almost, you know, to 2030 years. Why am I saying 2030? Because the church age is going to be about 2,000 years is all it's going to be. And 2030 would make it 2,000 years old because the church was inaugurated or commenced in uh, 8030. And so of course throughout this church age uh, obviously we have many abominations and so forth okay and so on. But then there's going to be a point in time right where and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more later in the lesson where Revelation 12 okay is going to come into fulfillment okay and Revelation 12 is going to begin the last half week and there'll be three and a half years until what until jesus returns and there's that final week at this point we've got 69 and a half weeks we've gone 2000 years we're going to have another half week which is going to make 70 weeks which will enter us into the millennium okay so having said that I want you to not, because so many people that study, you know, end times and all oh, Daniel, and this is so complicated, and it sounds like riddles, but then you got to somehow try to fit revelation in there. But really, I'd like you to think about it more linear. I'd like you to think about it like this. The Lord revealed to Daniel a whole bunch of stuff. What did he reveal? Basically, for the most part, he took Daniel up to the cross, is really what he did. 
He gave Daniel a little bit of information, a very, very tiny bit. He just basically referred to this death in time over here, but he didn't really give him information, not really, okay? So really, Daniel was brought up to about the cross, okay? But there's a lot more stuff that's got to happen. We've got that whole thing to happen. Well, what book gives us that? Revelation. Revelation. And so from there on, from AD 90 on, we take the book of Revelation that's going to bring us right through, not only through the millennium, but even until the new heaven and the new earth, right? Eternity future. Eternity future. Because the thousand years is just a thousand years. Okay, do you understand that? Mm -hmm. That's the timeline. That's how I want you to start thinking about Daniel and Revelation. Not like, oh my gosh, Daniel is so complicated. Daniel gives us the beginning of what has happened for the last days, and then Revelation takes over. And so Revelation really is a book that just gives us incredible, 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 incredible detail about the churches, which is super important because the churches are in the way, but then also it gives us all the information about what's going to happen. So curiosity. Mm -hmm. So we know 2030 is would be 2,000 2, years, years. years for the church, church age. So you think about it and you think, okay, so another eight years, but the way things are rapidly coming along, things are really changing to where it could really start after or maybe before 2030 to really start seeing ramping up exactly. and that's why i feel like i you know i really didn't want to do any of this last day stuff i really didn't and then i felt like the holy spirit really put oh, it in my heart know. a lot and we need to know we need to be prepared for what is coming and um you can't go to revelation you've got to start with daniel and that's why i've been mm -hmm. teaching this stuff so the more we review and the more you ask questions then the more you're going to, because I'm trying to just kind of simplify it, okay? So do you see what I'm talking about? Don't try to fit Daniel and, and Revelations together like that. Daniel just brings us basically to the cross. And then soon after that, Revelation takes us out the rest of the way. Did you see that? So that's why the Jews or the non-Christians would not know what to expect because they... They don't know the Bible first off. Right. The Jewish people they know too right. the time of Jesus. Right. But they don't even claim it. But they don't even they think it's a false Messiah. Correct. Okay. And remember, uh, for, uh, regarding the Jews, <laughs> so who was this revelation given to? It was given to a Jew named Daniel. Where were they when Daniel received the vision? They Babylon. were exiles in Babylon. Mm -hmm. What happened when they were in Babylon? They were without Torah based Judaism because they were out of the land and they were out of the temple because they can only sacrifice where at the temple that's the only place and so even though the, the priests were taken as well to babylon they were without torah based judaism okay so what did they come up with when they were in babylon what did they do they came up with synagogues that's where the synagogue was developed okay and the synagogue was a place that they would get together and they would read and expound scriptures and they would do you know that kind of stuff and they would pray but they weren't sacrificing. They weren't keeping the feast because you have to keep the feast in the land, right? And so it was it was an enigma for them. It was a problem for them. And then Cyrus comes along and does exactly what the Lord prophesied that he would do. You guys can go back for free. You don't even have to buy your way out of this, this, this land. Go for free. In fact, you can take money with you <laughs> to rebuild. All I'm asking for you is to bless me. Pray to your God about me. Wow, that was free. And we're going to talk about this tonight. Very few Jews went back mm -hmm. to rebuild. Okay. Well, what ended up happening all those years in Babylon, <laughs> along with the fact that when he went ahead and he, you know, released them. Okay. By the time you got the Jews that are filled up in the land when Messiah gets there, if they would have just stuck to studying scripture, 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 what the Lord had given them, what the Lord had given them, they would have done the same math that we've been doing these past weeks, and they would have been going, oh, and some did. I believe Nicodemus was one of those guys. You know what I mean? Jesus didn't look like the king. He didn't really understand it, but he understood between what Jesus said, what Jesus did, and you know what I'm saying? And there were many priests that did become believers, okay? But there were many that didn't. Well, what happened to the many that didn't? 
You know what they did is they had added all sorts of writings, all sorts of extra writings to what God had already said when they were in Babylon. And so the whole focus got off Torah and it got onto their rabbinical writings. And they just focused on that. Who said book called? The Talmud. Okay. What does the Talmud say about Jews reading Daniel? You know, I'm not, I don't know specifically, I can research that question, but what it was, it was additional, it was more like additional um, commentary on what was already written, which would be Torah, and probably some of the Psalms and Proverbs, and they weren't paying attention to the prophets that strongly. They were paying attention to their own commentary. Now, are they utilizing that today? Oh, absolutely. And so then what happened? So yeah, so then let's take it even further. So that's why they missed Christ. But if they would have Okay, so what did Daniel do before he ever got his first vision? He was studying the word of God. And who was he studying? He was studying the prophet Jeremiah. And as he studied, the Holy Spirit opened up to his mind. Your people are going to be here 70 years. And he realized, "Oh, it's 70 years." That's almost up. And all of a sudden, all this revelation started coming to him. But see, Daniel was one who was searching the scripture. So then he wrote down all of this stuff, and nobody else, well, I shouldn't say no one else, but generally speaking, the Jews wanted to focus on all the rabbinical writings and the extra writings that happened. You know what those are called? Babylonian traditions. They were Babylon. They, they, they developed traditions. Why did they develop traditions? Because they were without their temple. Mm -hmm. they, they had to make up other traditions, and that's what they did. Okay, and so they were studying the word. They were studying and focusing on all their traditions. What had happened before Messiah had come? What had happened? Rome had taken over, and all that Greek thinking and all that Greek behavior had infected Israel. And so that was the beginning of different sects of Jews organizing, saying, we can't have naked sports going on. That's a game. That's a given. We just can't do that. So what did they start doing? The Pharisees got together. They were they were trying to preserve Torah. And so if this was a picture of Torah right here, written, the written word of God, and they knew that what the Greek ideas that were coming in, you know, and all that they were doing, they had to preserve. And so the Pharisees started out really good. They were trying to preserve Torah-based, you know, understanding. But what did they do? They built their own rules and their own laws year after year after year after year after year. And that's why sinners weren't the ones who were like murderers and all that. Sinners in Jesus' day were the ones who had just given up on Torah. <sighs> Torah was 613 laws that God had given them. They had added so many more that they were just like, forget it, we can't do it. That's who the sinners were. And the Pharisees by that time had become a real sect. What were they interested in looking at? They were interested in looking at all the rules that they added. That's what they were looking at. And that's why they would say, what is it your disciples do this or do that or whatever? And Jesus would come back and say, it is written. Yeah. In other words, I don't care about your traditions. It is written. That's the only one that counts, mm -hmm. right? So that's what was happening. Those Babylonian traditions just really, really blinded them and deceived them big time. And it's easy to look at the Jews and go, wow, they just missed it. They just missed it. But listen, it isn't a Jewish problem. It is a human problem. And I'm here to tell you today, the church is not prepared for these last days. Just like the Jews were not prepared for Messiah's first advent, the church is not prepared for his second. And there's going to be so many surprises, okay? So do you understand what I'm talking about up here? That stuff with Satan on top? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to weave that into the lessons tonight. Is there any question on the timeline thing? You sure? None at all. Ask now. I mean, it's, I'd rather you just really think about it and ask because, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's all right. Um, going back to the time when the temple is going to be rebuilt, what did you say about that? Were they saying it's going to be rebuilt? Did you say no, the, the, the only temple on this side of the cross that the Lord is interested in now is us. His, we are the temple. temple. And he's building his temple. He's building his church. Because I just had a client saying that. Too. Okay, yeah. That's dispensationalism. Okay, okay the rebuilding of our material. And can you help me with 
Oh, I had spoken to another guy that studies the Bible, but he's quite a bit significant. And he indicated to me that the Jews were told if they read Daniel instead of the other one that they read in the book, that, that, uh, that their bones were going to disappear. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Let's see. It. Yeah, That's there's the a satanic, exactly, yeah. to keep them away. Yeah. And also, don't read Isaiah. They've kept that out of the Torah a lot. Or the Tanakh, I should say. Mm -hmm. It's not in the Torah. It's part of the Tanakh. Tanakh is a Hebrew word for Old Testament or the Bible or whatever. So, yeah, of course, you know, they don't want to search the scripture. The Jews' eyes have been spiritually blinded by the Lord. But I also am here to tell you that any Jew today who wants to find out the truth and will truly seek scripture his eyes can be opened if he's open to receiving by faith, okay? His eyes can be. That's why today God always has always had a remnant. Remember Elijah back in Kings after he dealt with the 400 prophets of Baal? Yeah. And then he, you know, killed them all. And then one woman, Jezebel, says, I'm coming after you. And he runs, runs, runs away. And he's scared. And what did he say to the Lord? I'm the only one left. That's it. I'm the only faithful one. And what the Lord say, mm, no, actually, I have 7,000 others I have reserved <laughs> that have never bowed their knee to Baal. That was a remnant. He's always had a remnant. There's never been a time before the cross or after the cross that the Lord has not had a faithful remnant of believing Jews. I'm now talking bloodline Jews now, you know. On this side of the cross, if you're a believing Jew, you are part of that one new man. There's no Jew, nor Greek, nor male, nor female, so forth, so on. You're part of the church, you're a temple. Okay, you understand that? Okay, so that's what I want you to think. Uh, you know, we'll keep building on this, but I just want you to understand the Lord came along and said, now I'm going to give a whole bunch of information about the world kingdoms. I'm going to give information about my son, and I'm going to talk how, how all of this is going to end. That's basically what Daniel is about, and Daniel was brought up to about the cross and left there, okay? And then God continues and gives John incredible revelation about that last time, Okay? All right, now let's go down here. Let's go back to Daniel for a minute, okay? Basically, for the big, big visions, we've got Daniel chapter 2, 7, 8, 9. And then when I put this like this, is because 10 through 12 is one vision, okay? And that's where we are. We're at the end of Daniel now, but it's going to take us a few weeks, okay? So let's review because, okay, what's the big picture? God is giving all of us through Daniel um, how the kingdom has been given over to the world kingdom and the world kings of Macomb. So we know that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, right? And that was a picture of all the kingdoms. There was the gold head, the silver arms, the bronze waist, the iron legs, and the iron clay feet and toes, right? Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Antichristo kingdom. That was a man from a man's point of view. God comes along and says, yeah, that's true. But actually, the way I see him is like beasts. So he talked in Daniel chapter 7 about the exact same kingdoms, except he describes them from his point of view. Man's like a beast. It's a human zoo. They're worse than the animals, right? And so what we have is we have Babylon and all the different beasts. Remember, let's see. There was a lion with an eagle's wing. It was a bear raised up on one. It was a leopard. And then Rome, okay, was a terrible beast. It was a terrible beast, but there was no beast of the earth to be able to describe it. What, what, how, why was it so terrible? Because this terrible beast was a composite of the worst of all of this. So it's bad, bad news. But it was, you see how it's still the same? You see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then you get to chapter 8, and now the Lord gives a whole bunch of information on just basically the Medo-Persian kingdom and the Greece kingdom. And now he represents them with clean animals, the ram and the goat. Okay? That's what that was about. Okay, so do you see what God is doing here in the book of Daniel? He's given it. He just keeps going down and down and down, okay? And this is all going to end up, this is an overview of that, all right? Now, then what happened in Daniel chapter 9? It was almost like a parenthesis or a pause. He got away from the world kingdoms, and God gave revelation to Daniel about who? The Messiah. That is the 70 weeks. All of this stuff to get done with, to get done with all these terrible beasts, it's going to take 70 weeks, and I've got it mapped out, and we know what the mapping is on that. Which brings us tonight to the last vision, which is chapters 10 through 12. 
obviously God didn't give these things in, in chapters. That was divided up later, okay? But it has been divided up into three chapters, so I'm going to take it like that, okay? Tonight, we're going to cover or the vision that Daniel had, not prophecy, but the vision of Gabriel and of Satan and what was going on there and the vision of the Lord. Then, in chapter 11, which we won't get through all of this next week, the Lord starts revealing to him the kings of the north and the kings of the south. Now, check this out. You've got all of these, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and Antichrist. Though. Now you come down, you've got now, Pers Persia, and Greece. Now you come down to the kings of the north and the south, and it's just about Greece. Now it's just about Greece. Do you see how it just keeps going down, down, down like that? Okay. And out of Greece is going to eventually come the Roman Empire. Okay. The lakes which is going to lead to, in 12, we get a little information about this dude that is a willful king. Who's he? Who's the willful king? Huh? The Antichrist, which would be really of the Roman Empire, but it came out of one of the kings of the north of the south. Stay tuned so that you can find out about it. That's how Daniel is shown all of this. I hope that clears it up of how it's going down. All right, I'm gonna let that sink in for a second. Are there any questions on that? No? Remember, on the Greece, the goat is Alexander the Great, right? And then from Alexander the Great, what happened to him? He died early. Right. His kingdom, was it given over to his son? No. No. What happened? It was divided up into four. And out of those four divisions of that huge kingdom that Alex had conquered, which was incredible, it was divided up territorially into four groups. Right. Out of those four groups, ended up permanently becoming just two groups called either the north or the south. And out of one of those ends up coming Rome, which will ultimately bring the willful king. And that's Daniel. Okay, so we will keep reviewing, because uh, the more you go over it, the more you know, you'll understand it. Any questions? Does that warm us up and get us back? Because we're off Messiah now. Now we're gonna talk about you know, what Daniel saw at the beginning of the last vision. Any questions at all? No? Good? You're good? Yeah? Good enough. Good enough. All right. Lord help us. Okay, so <laughs> let's start in tonight. Let's go to Daniel chapter 10, and let's just read the first nine verses. Okay? Mm -hmm. Chapter 10, the first nine verses. Okay, and it says, New King, New King James, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long. And he understood the message, and he had understanding of the vision, meaning that it was a long ways away. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Now, on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is, the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and I looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold, or euphaz, uh, was girded with gold of Euphaz. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them, so they fled and hid themselves. Therefore, I was left alone when I saw this great vision, and no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned to frailty in me, and I retained no strength. Yet, I heard the sound of his words, and while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. Mm -hmm. 
Wow, okay, so the time of the vision, all right, we're immediately provided in this portion of scripture that it was the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia. All right, that's easy enough. It has been approximately six years since Daniel received the uh, Daniel chapter seven vision. So he's getting this vision six years later from this, okay? Not that it's important, just, you know, thought. And it's been approximately four years since this vision, been four years in between that and that, okay? All right, now, remember, 10 through 12 is one vision, and it's the final vision ever given to Daniel in his life. He's probably about 90 years old at this point. And, of course, Joel had prophesied, old men will dream dreams and young men would see um, visions. Okay, so now let's look at letter B on your outline, the Daniel fast. During this period of time, Daniel was in mourning for three weeks. That is weeks of days, not weeks of years. So it's days, not years. And we know that three weeks of days would be 21 days, right? Okay. And for 21 days, he ate no pleasant bread, neither did he eat uh, meat or wine, and he didn't anoint himself with oil. Keep in mind, Daniel would have been living most of his life in luxury in the, in the um, palace, okay? So he, even at 90, exhibited self-control over the appetites of a carnal man. And he sought the Lord in deep, deep humiliation of his body and soul. And this kind of fast has been spoken of as, I know you guys have heard about it, the Daniel fast. Mm -hmm. And it isn't a total abstinence. It's rather partial in particular. Okay, Daniel understands something. He understands that fasting and mourning are foundation for understanding. In fact, fasting is an intensified ingredient of prayer. It is an act of faith, but it is a physical act, if done with prayer, that brings on a spiritual effect. Okay, it's like baptism. You can fast and you can baptize with no meaning, and you could fast and baptize with great meaning. It's how you do it. You get into the waters of baptism and have no repentance and can come up out of the waters. All you did was get in and get wet. That wasn't what was meant to happen in the waters of baptism. The same thing with fasting. You can just say, okay, forget it. I'm just not going to eat, you know, and have no real, true, extra revelation from God. So it is the natural and the supernatural coming together in a dynamic relationship. Now, he began his um, fast on the third day of the first month. We know that because he said it was the 24th day. So if you take the 24th day minus 21, what do you end up with? Three, mm -hmm. right? So he began it on the third day. We already have been told it was the first month. So if you take beginning a fast on the third day, that means that the end of the first week of his fast would have landed him on the 10th day. Okay, that's what I have there, I think, in letter A. And you know what? That was the day that the Hebrew families would choose a Passover lamb in preparation for Passover. Now, the end of the second week of his fast would have ended up landing on the 17th day. And you know what that day was? Centuries later, that was the day that Christ rose from the grave. Isn't that neat? Yeah. And the end of the third week on the 21st, uh, 21st day of his fast would land him on the 24th day. And that was the day that the risen Lord Jesus Christ appeared to his disciples the second time in the Gospels. Uh -huh. So these are significant days in which he did this fast, okay? <laughs> so um, uh, now what happens is in this portion of scripture, he, Jesus, appears to Daniel as what? His pre-incarnate glory. But he's not appearing as Jesus because Jesus, he didn't become Jesus until he was born of Mary. So he's pre-incarnate and he is appearing to Daniel. And now he's appearing as Israel's mighty prince and captain. And a prince or a captain is a man and the new testament confirms these things as well as these days that have special importance think about this before the cross christ entered jerusalem on the 10th day of the passover month that was palm sunday and he rose on the 17th day and he appeared to his disciples on the 24th day and all this was done 
by Daniel being led to fast at this point in time. Now, why in the world was Daniel fasting and praying with such a burden? What was going on that would have caused Daniel to drive him to his knees and to fast? Here's why. He would have known that the Jews had returned and were rebuilding from the 70 weeks prophecy. And he knew that God had told him in that 70 weeks prophecy, you will even rebuild in troublous times. That would have been that seven week period right here. Do you remember that? You will go back and you will rebuild the temple. You will rebuild Jerusalem. And Cyrus, what had he already said? This is the third year of Cyrus. And Cyrus has already said, you can go back. You can build. So that is what Daniel was feeling an incredible burden over. Okay? He probably, being in the palace, would have been receiving sporadic reports about how it was going there. Okay? Cyrus had issued the decree to restore and rebuild. The returning exiles that went back to do that job numbered really only 42,360. However, the servants and the maids and the singers weren't counted in that. So we believe it was probably only about 50,000. Isn't that sad? Mm -hmm. Do you realize that most of the Jews had become content to stay in Babylon? And they did. Yet, they still wanted to be known as Jews while in Babylon. Now, metaphorically, what am I drawing a, a line here, or a comparison here with? Come out of Babylon. Come out of Egypt. What is come out? Ecclesia. The church has to what? Come out of the world. Come out of the world. Mm -hmm. Most of the Jews didn't even want to come out of Babylon. They wanted to remain Jews, mm -hmm. and they wanted to remain where? In Babylon. But there's a coming out, and only about 50,000 ended up going back, okay? Most wanted to stay. They had made their homes there. They had started their business up. You know what? The economy was pretty good. And then how many were there? About 50,000. Oh, how many Jews oh there? man, that would have been a lot. I can try to get the number on that, but it would have been... Curious. Yeah, oh, I, you know... So it was a million? Probably a million, maybe more. Yeah. Probably. But most said, no thanks, we're fine. Isn't that sad? Mm -hmm. Wow. But how many people today have come out of the world that are in the church? Mm -hmm. okay. the claim, they claim to be... That Christians. is what we are. The church is called to come out of the world, correct? Uh, right, but really, truly, how many have really come out? That's what I'm saying. God has always had a remnant. But I'm telling you, and this is why when we get into Revelation, and we're going to talk about those letters a long time, why are they heavy? Mm -hmm. The church is not prepared. We're preparing we're preparing it's serious it really actually means what it says all right anyways you see it's not jews it's human nature okay um now Jana was too old to make the journey god's will for what for him was to can you continue and stay there serving um the leaders in the persian kingdom he was 90 years old he couldn't have made it okay now what was going on back in the land well, the temple was being restored, rebuilt, and guess what? Sacrifices were once again being offered. They hadn't been for 70 years. So now they got sacrifices. That's the only place you can do it is where the temple is. The Feast of Tabernacle was being kept. In other words, the foundations were being properly laid again, both physically and spiritually. Guess what else happened? Cyrus said, yeah, go ahead and get the vessels that Babylon, uh, that ne uh, Nebuchadnezzar took, you know, and brought to Babylon. Yeah, you can return those. Jeremiah's word that that would happen is now being restored. The vessels from the original temple, Solomon's temple, was now taken back with the Jews, okay? But also we know what was prophesied in Daniel chapter 9 in the 70 weeks prophecy was that there would be troublous times that they would have to rebuild in. The enemies of the Jews that were in the land rose up and hindered the work of restoration. It was not easy, it was hard. And also then the Jews that went back to the land, they got busy building their own houses and they started neglecting the house of the Lord. That's what the prophet Haggai, the book of Haggai is all about, okay? So it means there was trouble inside the church and there was trouble outside the church. You see that? So I call that under number two, the restoration ministry. That's what was happening. A restoration ministry was happening, but from every level, there was pressure 
Okay, now who were the leaders of this restoration ministry that Cyrus had gone ahead and said, yeah, go for it, go, go back and do it, build it up, Zerubbabel. He was considered a prince, or really a better word for him would have been a governor. He was of the line of the house of David, so he was of David's DNA. But understand that when Cyrus sent the Jews back, never again did the Jews have a king, a human king, or a palace. They never had that again, okay? So he acted as a governor who led the group back to Jerusalem and directed the work of rebuilding the temple. He saw it completed. What about Joshua? Okay, he was the high priest. And he went back. That means he would have been of the tribe of Levi. He had oversight of the restoration of the temple services and its administration. Okay, you guys heard of Ez Ezra? Mm -hmm. yeah. Ezra was a scribe. He was also a priest. That means he was of the tribe of Levi. He led that remnant that went back to build. He led them in a spiritual awakening. What do you think he did that with? How did he, how did he lead in a spiritual awakening? The restoration of the word of God. He went right back to the word. He didn't do the Babylonian Talmud and the traditions. And that's what he did. He brought the word back. The law of God. The word of the Lord. You know what else? You know the first piece of furniture that was restored when they got back to the land? Even before even before the, 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 the foundation was laid? No, it would have been the altar. The altar was restored. What does that represent? That's the place of repentance. Right? In the house of the Lord, it's the first article that was restored, the altar. We've got to start sacrificing. Blood is the only thing that will cover our sins. What about, you've heard of these guys, right, in the Old Testament, Haggai and Zechariah. They were prophets. Mm -hmm. And they were prophets during this restoration, and they worked with the people by the prophetic word. It was the ministry of the Holy Spirit. God was coming upon these men, speaking his words to the people. Okay? So Haggai and Zechariah, as well as Nehemiah, you know what they did? They encouraged the people. They reproved the people. That means gently. They reproved them. They rebuked the people. That means sharply. And they encouraged them. Whatever was necessary from time to time, that is what our prophetic ministry is today. Do you remember what I told you? We are speak words of conviction or exhortation or edification or comfort. That's what they were doing at that time. Okay, Nehemiah, he happened to be the Persian king, king's cupbearer, but he left, he felt so bad, he left, he went into the land and he helped finish the city walls and the gates. And they were miraculously completed in 52 days. Okay, that's a whole other story. So with all of these things going on, where's Daniel? Well, he's back in Persia with this incredible burden for the people. He's fasting. He's praying. He knows that they're up against a lot of enemies in the land that they would be fighting. Probably they got reports. Certainly not as fast as the internet, but they got reports back, okay? Okay. And he just made work of prayer and intercession and fasting because he just, he felt so bad about what they were facing from the enemies in the land. So what happens when he's doing all of this fasting and interceding? Let her see the vision of Christ. Daniel is by the river of um, Hedekel. That's the Hebrew word for Hedekel. It's the same as the Tigris River, and that's first mentioned in Genesis chapter 2 in the Garden of Eden. And Hedekel means a quick, sharp voice. Hedekel. And Daniel's eyes are open in vision, and he receives what we talk, talked about before. He, he received a Christophany. All right, now what is a Christophany? It is a pre-cross manifestation and revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God before his incarnation okay so to confirm that this vision is a christophany then what you have to do is you have to compare what he saw and study the visions of daniel and ezekiel of the pre-incarnate christ with john's vision in revelation of the incarnate glorified Christ. And you know what you'll find out? You'll see that they're actually the same is what you'll see, okay? And what we are giving here in the, in the book of Daniel, we are given a tenfold description of the glory of the pre-incarnate Christ. And I've got the ten 
things that were, we, we just read them a few minutes ago. All right, let's go through it. His humanity. It said in verse 5, a certain man. Look at that in the Bible where it says a man. And that points to the Lord Jesus Christ in his future humanity. He was the son of God, but guess what? In due time, he became the son of man. God manifest in flesh. There's other places in Daniel. Who was the fourth man in the fire? It was the son of man, right? The pre-incarnate Christ. The same with the man seen in, over the beast kingdoms. What was the next thing? His clothing. He was clothed in linen, meaning a shining white garment. This speaks of his purity, his holiness, his righteousness. The high priests and priests were clothed in white linen in service. The tabernacle and um, greatly noted their clothing on the Day of Atonement, the cleansing in the sanctuary. How did the sanctuary get cleansed? By the blood. But they were mostly dressed in white. The high priest had other colors on too, but a lot of the white was, was base. Or, or, or he was first dressed in all white, and then there were other colors added on. Okay, um, so that speaks of his righteousness. What about his waist? The next thing, his waist. He was girded with the fine gold of Euphaz. God speaks of divinity, and the waist speaks of strength and service. I should say not God, gold. Gold speaks of divinity. And the waist speaks of strength and service. I love that. Listen to that. Strength and service. If you go and you work out, or if you have back problems, what does everybody tell you? You need to strengthen your core. Your core. Your core. And that's the, the, the basis of all sports is you've got to have such strong core. Core is where it's at. Guess what? Spiritually, that's where we see it too. Okay, it's the core. Strength. All right, what about his body was the next description. It was like the barrel or chrysolite. And this is associated with the garments of the high priest. It's the beauty and glory of precious stones. The priest wore like a thing over his white linen, and it had 12 different beautiful stones that you could almost just see right through. But they were different colors, and they were beautiful. Okay? And because they were transparent, it sp spoke not only of purity, but of, uh, again, the glory and so forth. What about his face? That was the next thing. It says in the scripture that it was as the appearance of lightning, bright flashing light. What does that speak of? Dignity, majesty, glory for sure. Think about when Jesus was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration before Peter, James, and John. If you go to Matthew and read that, it's recorded in Matthew that his face shone like the sun and that his clothes became as white as light. So you see the consistency all the way through the word of God. What about his eyes? His eyes, it says in Daniel, were as lamps of fire. It speaks of the shining light burning from within. You know what it really speaks of? He looks at you and he has insight of you and foresight hindsight there's penetration when he looks there's discernment of all things everything is open he was anointed with the power of the holy spirit right can you imagine what it must have been like for people to look at him that's why it's not just what he did just looking at him you're just like you're just caught like you you, you want to look away but you can't it's like i've never seen anything look like that at me but you know what i mean that's what it was like his eyes now here's interesting his arms and his feet are described in like manner they are like polished brass isn't that interesting now i want to tell you something the metal brass or bronze it always speaks against judgment against sin it speaks of judgment against sin that is what bronze or brass represents not mercy it does not represent mercy bronze represents judgment against sin his arms are like polished brass but now look at this his feet are also as brass isn't that something Brass is judgment against all sin and self. All things evil are going to be put under what? His, his feet. All things evil are going to be put under Jesus' feet, right? Mm -hmm. 
Isn't that something? Now, those of you who know a little bit about the book of Revelation, in the beginning, it's all the different letters to the church, right? Where does Jesus walk first among the churches? He's got to walk among the churches. What's he doing there? Where does judgment begin? The house of the Lord. That's right. It begins in the house of the Lord. That's why those are feet of judgment against sin and self. Very serious. Very serious. If you go back to the tabernacle of Moses, it was made of brass pillars, a brass altar, and a brass laver. Brass was impressed on everything in the outer court. What happened in the outer court? That's where sin was dealt with. Sin was not dealt with in the inner court or the Holy of Holies. Sin was dealt at the altar. And then the washing of the laver, it was also brass. That's what brass is all about. All right, what about his voice? His voice is like the uh, a multitude. It's awe-inspiring, overpowering, and majestic. It would be like standing next to the Niagara Falls. Have you guys ever been to the Niagara Falls? How noisy? It's just like, wow, I was a little girl. I went, I was just like, oh, <laughs> it's crazy. And then his words. Daniel said, I heard the voice of his words. Now, at this point, Daniel just faints forward to the ground. He just falls flat over, like in a trance. The awesome words of Christ overpowered Daniel in all that he had to say to him. And Daniel's greatly loved. You know what I thought of when I, when I was reading that? I love it. In John 18, it's the only place in the Gospels that this is recorded, that the Roman soldiers, Judas, is uh, the traitor. Judas was given a contingent of Roman guards and uh, Roman soldiers and temple guards. And John records that they come running in and they said, Jesus said, who are you looking for? And they said, we're looking for Jesus the Nazarene. And John records it. None of, it's never recorded anywhere else. It's amazing to me. And Jesus <coughs> said, I am he. And what happened to all those Roman soldiers and guards? <coughs> right over can you imagine wow coming to arrest god in the flesh and he says i am yeah we'd all be we'd be out <laughs> okay so anyways let's go really quick to revelation chapter one let's go to verse 10 just so that you can see this is one example of another revelation of Christ. But you're going to see how similar it is. Revelation chapter 1, starting at verse 10. This is John, the baby disciple who's now very old on the island of Patmos. And look at this, what he said. Verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a gold band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes <coughs> like a flame of fire. There it is again. Oh, look at his feet. What are they like? Bronze. There it is, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars out of his mouth when a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. As dead. You just do that. That's what it would be like, you know. So Daniel, in the Old Testament, John, in the New Testament, both get to behold the same glorified Lord. Here's the difference. Daniel sees him before his incarnation, humiliation, and crucifixion. Mm -hmm. John sees him after his incarnation, his sinless life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and his glorification. So that means there is a pre-incarnate Christ that is revealed in the Bible, but there's also the incarnate glorified Christ. And both are introductory to the visions that follow, right? Because that's what Daniel 
received here, now he's going to receive a vision. That's what John received, and he's getting ready to receive a vision. Okay? All right. Now, notice in verse 7 and 9 of Daniel, we see the effect that all of this had on the other men who were with Daniel. There were other guys with Daniel that day. They were down there at the river, Tigris. They knew something supernatural was taking place, and a trembling fell upon them, and they just fled to hide from whatever was happening. They were like, oh, peace out. <laughs> we are out of here. There is no way that was so scary, okay? But the effect that it had on Daniel was that it left him without strength, and he was holy. He was a righteous man. He fell to the ground as if he heard the awesome words of the pre-incarnate Christ. Now, it's important to note something. In Daniel chapter 8, Daniel heard the voice of God. But in Daniel chapter uh, 10, he not only hears, but he also sees the glorious Christ. And that's the big difference. He did not see anything in chapter 8. He only heard the voice of God. Here, he hears and he sees. So it's, it's a double whammy, okay? The same effect happened to Ezekiel as John. Also, what about Saul, who became Paul, right? On the road to Damascus, blinded him. He went blind, okay? All right, so that brings us down to the last. Let's do the heavenly warfare. Let's read 10 through 21 of this chapter. Any questions so far? No? We're good? Okay. Uh, chapter 10, verse 10. Okay. Um, Daniel? Of Daniel, yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay, so suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. So, you know, that's a different position he's in now. And he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man greatly beloved, Understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And while he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. And then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. But... The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, or the time of the end. For the vision refers to many days yet to come. When he had spoken such words to me, I turned my face toward the ground and became speechless. And suddenly, one having the likeness of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth, spoke, saying to him who stood before me, My Lord, because of the vision, my sorrows have overwhelmed me, and I have retained no strength. For how can this servant of my Lord talk with you, my Lord? As for me, no strength remains in me now nor is any breath left in me. Then again, the one having the likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me. Oh, he, and he said, O oh man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. So when he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. And then he said, do you know why I have come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. Wow. Okay, so let's talk about all of that, all right? The divine touch. Daniel is overcome with the glory of the messianic vision that he's just had. He needed and he received a touch of the Lord to strengthen him in order to receive the vision of what? The time of the end. Many days from now. Okay. 
Now remember, Daniel 10, 11, and 12 is one continuous vision. So from being flat on his face, Daniel was now set up on his hands and his knees, much like a dog. And he was told that he was greatly beloved. And then from that position, he was told to stand upright. And then he was told that he was to understand the words that were going to be spoken to him. Keep in mind, he's 90 years old at this point in time. He's trembling. And he was then told for a second time that he was greatly loved. You know what it confirms? It confirms that revelation comes to those who love the Lord and who are loved by him and seek after him. Well, anyways, the vision now that Daniel is seeing turns from the Lord, the Son of God, to the angel Gabriel, who's now been sent to Daniel. Gabriel is the archangel who works together with Michael, the archangel. And Gabriel told Daniel, fear not, a common word to God's people in time of visitation. And it's a comfort word to all the saints and all the ages. The answer was already on the way from the very first day that Daniel sought the Lord. The answer was already on the way, you guys. The answer is already on its way in every one of your situations. The answer is on its way. The answer had been delayed for 21 days. Now you must understand, Daniel has absolutely no idea whatsoever as to what's been going on in the realm of the spirit, or as we call it, the invisible realm. On this side of the cross, and you become a Christian, and it's not long at all, especially if you're in a spirit-filled Bible study or church, you very quickly come to a realization about the invisible realm and the spiritual realm. Daniel, way back here, he has no clue. In fact, it probably all sounded like, wait, wait, what? That was probably what it was. you got to remember, Gabriel represents, on that side of the cross, ministry of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And he proceeds to give Daniel insight as to what was happening in the spirit realm. And it's a quick explanation of warfare that's going on in the heavenlies. Huh? Huh? What's going on? There's something going on where I can't see it? You see, verse 13 and 20 reveal something of the unseen realm, the spiritual warfare and the workings of Satan and his host in the kingdom of darkness. The angel tells Daniel that it was the prince of the kingdom of Persia who blockaded him for 21 days while he was trying to get to Daniel and to provide answers to his prayer that he had been told. The minute the Lord heard Daniel's prayer, Gabriel, go, go to Daniel. Here's the answer. Here's the answer, Chris. Here's the, and he's doing it, right? He's doing it. And what happens? He's upheld. So what ends up happening, okay? Well, this guy blockades him, and Michael then, one of God's chief princes or archangels was called, you're gonna have to go. You're gonna have to go, and you're gonna have to help Gabriel, because Gabriel got caught up in a battle. He's caught, he's held up, he isn't getting to my man, Dan. The conflict was not with Cyrus, the king of Persia because it was Cyrus who had given the decree for the Jews to return and rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. yeah. There was opposition by enemies to the work of the restoration. Daniel knew all about that, those that were in the land, right? But now Daniel's finding out there's a whole other set of enemies that I had no clue about, and they're in the heavenlies. Satan's princes and his hosts were battling hard in the heavenlies against this restoration. And if you're praying for a restoration right now, a righteous restoration, that's what's going on. They're battling hard in the heavenlies against restoration. That is what's happening. This is what you have got to keep in sight. Daniel, he's like, what? We get to know, we know much more today than Daniel. What Daniel received was seed form. Mm -hmm. Seed form, he only got it in seed. He only got a little bit. We, we've got the whole book of Ephesians, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're battling hard. Now notice, 
We've talked about a lot of the word, we've used the word in the book of Daniel a lot, princes. There are two groups of princes in the universe. There are princes of God in the heavenly kingdom, and there are princes of Satan in his kingdom of darkness. What about the prince of the kingdom of Persia that we just are talking about right now? In chapter 11, there are three kings that are yet going to stand in Persia, and they're called princes also. What about the prince who's to come in this chapter right here? It was a prince other than Prince Messiah who was going to come. It was Prince Titus who came and desolated Jerusalem and the temple. But what about God's princes? Gabriel the prince, Michael the prince, Messiah the prince. Did you know what Hebrews tells us? In chapter 1, it says that God's angels are ministering spirits sent to those who are heirs of God's salvation. We've got angels right now who are battling over our situations that the enemy is trying to blockade because we are God's people. We are heirs to salvation and there is a war going on. I went out today to pray and I was just, you know, it's been so dreary, right? It was just so beautiful and I looked up the sky and I just said, Lord, it's so beautiful. And he reminded me, you, do you, you, you just studied this, Nat. You know? <laughs> what do you think's going on up here? And I was like, oh my gosh, if we could just, you know, do that, we would be blown away with the world. You think that what we're seeing with the pictures on TV is bad? Not even close. Not even close. So Daniel 10 provides some insight into spiritual warfare from the Old Testament, the conflict of these invisible kingdoms, okay, that are war over the inhabitants of the kingdoms of the earth, okay? These are so real. Paul speaks of the kingdom of darkness and the various ranks in the kingdom of Satan. Go to Ephesians. Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, wicked spirits in heavenly places, warfare in the heavenly. He gives all sorts of different ranks and files and, and you know, whatever, metals, whatever they do, right? But what is their work? Listen, their work is to oppose all that is divinely appointed, especially the purposes of God in the earth. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven doesn't just mean, just mean, Jesus come back and establish your kingdom in the earth. It certainly means that. But what that means is today, today, in order to get there, thy kingdom come. Inventora on our streets, where we are living, on earth as it is in heaven, which means today it's war. Today it's a battle. In the historical setting, think about what it all happened so far from Daniel's point of view. Babylon has fallen. Medo-Persia has come to power. There's a restoration in Judah and Jerusalem taking place. All of that is going on. But the various princes of world kingdoms under satanic influence and control were opposing the restoration work going on in Jerusalem. They were opposing it in the invisible realm, and there were enemies there that were working against them as well. You want to see it again? Go to Zechariah chapter 3. Read that. You know what Zechariah got to see in his vision? He got to see Satan literally standing next to Joshua, the high priest, trying to oppose his priestly functions. Wow. See, then there's Satan activity against God's servant, Job. Oh, poor old Job. He knew none of this. And if he would have known what we know today about him, mm -hmm. that it wasn't just that Satan hit him hard, but that it was the Lord who said, have you considered my guy down there, Job? Have you? It's God that initiated that wager. Is it possible that Satan and the Lord has had a discussion about you? Absolutely. Absolutely it is. Oh yeah, but she, she'll, she'll curse you. He'll curse you if you take away that protection. No, go ahead. You can you can touch my servant this far, no farther. You can do all of that. You can do whatever you want. What you can't do is this right here. There's a line because I'm sovereign. I'm king of kings. I'm on the throne. And all of a sudden, somebody's life just turns up, tied down, and they're almost dead. Right? They're doing this and that and everything. Their health and their wealth and, and everything just goes. And we just go, Lord, why is the Lord allowing this? Well, he probably might have possibly brought it on. 
See, here's the comfort in it. Nothing ever touches any one of us who belong to the Lord that isn't passed through the will of God. You know what that ultimately means? It means that ultimately God brought it. That's really what it means. So you can say, well, the devil's against me, or the enemy is against me, and they're evil forces. You might as well say God brought it, is really what you might as well say. He's sovereign, and everything's going to be ready when it's time for Jesus to return. And everything that's happening, everything that's happening down here with unbelievers as well as believers, it's all, you know what the Lord is? He's above all of that fighting. He's like, mm huh? Yes, it's all going perfectly according to plan. It's right. It's right. Yep, it's right. That's what's going on. But for Daniel, the first time he finds out that there is spiritual warfare taking place against the purposes of God and the people of God. No wonder he was burdened in prayer and intercession and mourning. All of that revealed this vision to him. Satan is the god of this world system. He holds sway. Don't be, don't be deceived. He holds sway over the kingdoms of this world world for a certain amount of time the lord has given him a huge amount of rope he's going to hang himself with it but the lord has given him a lot of rope satan is the prince of the power of the air he's the prince of darkness he controls a lot of the princes of this world system he does influence the minds and the wills of rulers he does but you can't blame everything on satan because we as believers what are we fighting what are our three enemies the world our own flesh and the devil that's three things the demonic is one third two thirds is this stuff mm -hmm. but it's very real and then daniel's told the prince of the kingdom of persia and then greece is going to come after that the principalities and powers and they are influencing earthly kings and kingdoms satan's a fallen angel and he's fighting hard against god's elect he's fighting hard against god's holy angels He's fighting hard against Gabriel. He's fighting hard against Michael. What did Gabriel say to Daniel? Well, when I'm done talking to you, I got to get back in the fray. I got to get right back in it. I got to go back and help Michael. They're fighting 24 seven, they don't sleep. Mm -hmm. And what do we want? Oh, just get us out of the fight, get us out. See, the Lord is described in Exodus 15 as the Lord is the man of war. You see, you have to understand there is a holy war going on in the spirit realm 24-7. Don't be deceived. But he's the captain of the Lord of hosts. The ultimate war, okay, the ultimate war is the war in heaven. When things get worse on the earth, do you know why things and more conflict happens on the earth? It's a spillage of what's going on up here. The more things heat up here, the more they spill over onto the earth. Now, why is all of a sudden the earth just full of chaos like crazy? Because, guess what? Satan knows. What? Short time. Short time. It's a short time. So it's spilling over like crazy. All right? So what's going to happen? How much worse is it going to get? Because I was seeing some pretty terrible pictures on the news today of wars and all sorts of stuff. And I'm hearing things and it makes me sick and it makes me mad. And yet I have to say, by faith, you are King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You are on the throne and all is working together for good. No weapon formed against me will prosper and all of these other things. I say that by faith. It doesn't seem to line up with facts, but I don't care. I'm going to say it because I know. I know what Daniel knows, right? What's going to happen? Okay, watch. This is what's going to happen. It's heating up harder and harder. Can you imagine how tired, well, maybe they're not tired, but can you imagine the fighting that the holy angels are going on right now up in the heavenlies? How many angels fell? A third. Two thirds against one third, and they're fighting like crazy because look at how bad it is down here. But this is what's going to happen pretty soon. The two-thirds angels, they're going to win. Okay? It's going to be over. The war in the heavenlies is going to be over. And Satan and all of his minions in Revelation chapter 12 are going to be cast out of the heavenly realms. It's going to be over in the heavenly realms in chapter 12. When that happens, 
Where can Satan and his minions go? Right now. Yeah. Only here. And what's he going to have to do? He's going to have to incarnate himself into a, a man. That's what's going to happen. And I tell you, when that happens, all hell is going to break out. For how long? Three, Three and a half years. That's what is in the picture. Okay, you got questions. Okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> it's hard to understand fighting in heaven. Mm -hmm. The angels, they never die. They're fighting against each other. What do they What do they propose to win in this if they're not dying? They're, well, they're, they're fighting for God's kingdom. kingdom. They're fighting for kingdom kids. on earth. But what's the fight? So Over? No, no. What's the fight they fought? Are we talking blow up, hitting, stabbing? I mean, what is it? They don't fight against flesh and blood. Right. I know that. So for we, I don't know. How does it look like if we saw, Sorry. what would it look like? I don't know. But there's an overpowering. I can tell you that. Because it's heating up. I think that that's why it's spilling over. I think that the two-thirds angels are getting, I are, are conquering. They're starting to overpower. And so guess who's who's getting heated up? You know the saying, you know what rolls downhill, right? When things get bad at work, you know? You know Snowball. the saying, huh? Snowballs roll down. Snowballs roll down. Also, so if, and I understand what you're saying, Patricia, but as, as too, as we get closer and more people come, it's going to be, some people will fall away, but then you're going to get those that are being prayed for as far as their salvation and that's what they're fighting for to keep to keep us away from well CBS what you're getting there. into is you're getting into the two words that are basically used in in revelation and i'm going to teach on it there's two words there's overcome or overcomer so we'll get into that when we get into revelation okay. some are going to be overcome yep so so Satan is in heaven right now. In the heaven lease, yes. So he's not necessarily here on earth. Well, he, he has won't. access to earth. And we know it through Job and other things. But the, he will be, in Revelation 12, he's cast out of heaven. Mm -hmm. And he falls yeah. where? Yeah. He has yeah. nothing. He, he, he doesn't yeah. fight with flesh and blood right now because he is an angel. That's why he has to incarnate himself oh. in what? Oh. A man. A man. Yeah. And somebody's going to say, yeah, sure, I'll do it. Okay. Yeah, I'll do it. Right? And that's what's going to happen. And that's why it's going to get so bad. And God has allowed all of that. Never forget, he is not omnipotent. He is not omniscient. He is not omnipresent. He is a created being. Therefore, he's limited and he is subject to the almighty sovereign God. Satan and his evil princes and hordes of evil minions are seeking to influence the minds of all earthly princes. They are hoping to keep the unbelievers here in the dark, keep them in the dark, and he's trying to get those that have been delivered out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light gone and out. And this is why I'm telling you the church is not prepared. Right. We're preparing, yes. Couldn't he already be down here, though? Well, he's 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 I mean, not. Couldn't he have been bumped out already? And... No, he's <laughs> not like what's going to be in Revelation twelve. But I mean, when he comes down, couldn't he come as a child or no? No, he's going to no. come as he's a going man, to like, incarnate a man. He's going to incarnate a man out of nowhere, like all of a sudden. He's I, gonna... I, 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 he's going to offer the post. He offered that post to Jesus. In the desert, he took him up in the spirit of the pinnacle of the temple and said, look at all the kingdoms. I can offer everything to you. He offered him the post of Antichrist is what he offered Jesus. Okay? Jesus never said, oh, excuse me, dude, they're not yours to give. He never said that. He knew that they, he, it is theirs. But Jesus says, that's not how I'm going to get the kingdoms. I serve my father. I do it his way. The man okay. who ultimately will say, yeah, I'll do it, is probably here. Well, somewhere. that's what I was curious probably. about. Is probably. that what you mean? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. I'm like, isn't he maybe a month? Could so, be. So in other All my words, life I've different. had questions, if, listen, if through church and family. You think the Antichrist is born yet? The, the, the man who's going to be incarnated with Satan? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. I just don't know. I don't know. But I can tell you one thing, as you were saying earlier, if you look at 2030 and you look at what's happening, I just can't believe what's happened in the last two years. It blows yeah. my mind. Yes. So, you know, I'm, yeah. 
things aren't, aren't looking good in the short term, but really they're looking very good. They're looking very, very good. Okay. Mm -hmm. So keep in mind. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So when you look at the heart and the person of Putin, or what's his name? Is that yeah. Putin. Yeah. Putin. Yeah. Can, can you imagine already if Satan said, "Hey, I will give you whatever." Yeah. To whoever. Well, that's what I was just going to bring up too. To All you have to do is look back at what we know. Look at Nimrod, right? Who put up the Tower of Babel? Look at Pharaoh in Egypt. Listen, God strived with Pharaoh. Let my people go. Let my people go. How many times did yeah. he say that? Right? What would have happened if Pharaoh would have said, you know, okay, you are king of kings. I'm just a king, but you are king of kings, and they are your people. I'm going to let them go. God would have still done something, but it would have been a whole different, but he didn't. And finally, God said, okay, I'm going to strengthen you in your decision. But we see that God fights and he strives with, with leaders and with people. He does it with everyone. No one will be able to stand before God and say, well, you, you left me out of striving. You didn't strive with me. No one will be able to say that. We all are. That's why it's so blessed. It's such a blessing. You look at the Hollywood elite, the global elite. You look at the very rich. You look at the kings of this world. Listen, we are so blessed that we're nobodies. Yeah. <laughs> we are so very blessed that we are nobodies. Okay? And so now Gabriel is returns from speaking with Daniel, and he's got to get back into the fray with the prince of Persia. He says, yeah, and then there's the Greece that's going to be coming yet. Can you imagine if we could see the war going on over the world today, think about the really rough spots of where it's really yeah. spilling over. But look at what's happened to America. For how many years, even us sitting here, most of us sitting here, we could think about our childhood. There wasn't that much conflict. There wasn't, why? We had walls of protection up about us. Why? Because we were under God, one nation under God. And therefore we were indivisible, but we shoved God right out of here. We shoved those walls right down and look at the spillage. Well, that's going to happen worldwide, okay? And that's just what it is. Now, I want you to see a couple of really quick things. Michael is uh, the archangel Michael. I mean, Michael means who's like God, okay? He's especially associated with spiritual warfare in the heavenlies. He's a special protector of Israel. That means both the natural Israel and spiritual Israel, okay? Because both belong to the Lord. He's also associated with the resurrection of the body. You can read about that in Jude, uh, Jude 9. He, he had a fight with Satan over Moses' body. Okay? And so he represents the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's what Michael represents, the Word made flesh. But Gabriel, he represents what? The Holy Spirit. So you can see Michael and Gabriel are working Word and Spirit. True worshipers, how do they live? In spirit and in truth, and that's what that is. Okay, they work together. And these holy angels stand up to do God's will and to strengthen the saints, okay? Um, the vision is going to be told that it's in the latter days, okay? It's evident that Daniel didn't fully understand everything. Uh, later on in Daniel 8, he uh, is going to continue <clears throat> that vision. I already explained that to you. Um, there's a lot of things in Daniel's mind that he doesn't understand that he's being told. I don't get the little horn. I don't get the three and a half year period. I don't get the, you know, all of those things he didn't understand. But divine strength, he's touched again by the pre-incarnate Lord. And he's touched his lips this time. And he explained how much the vision had affected him, leaving him in sorrow and with no strength, okay? But he received another touch from the Lord. In verse 18, it says, the one having the likeness of a man. And he was further strengthened. He was told again that he was greatly loved. But then look at what the Lord told him. He gave him three things. And hear this, the word to you. He says, fear not. Do not fear. Fear not, Dan. It's a command. If you diagram that sentence, that's a commanding sentence. Peace to you. I'm going to give you peace. And the Lord is our peace. And then he said, be strong. And then he repeated that, be strong, a command. And Daniel was strengthened to receive the divine words. And throughout the book of Daniel, he received a touch from the Lord. Three touches from the Lord in this chapter, okay? He needed that from the Lord, a special touch. Do we look for angels to touch us? No, we have the very Holy Spirit living Spirit. in us. Mm -hmm. And the same words are said to us, fear not, peace, be strong okay so he tells daniel i gotta return i gotta fight it out with satan and um 
the prince is over Persia. He's obviously resisting the people of God, trying to rebuild Jerusalem and the work of restoration. And then he's told that the scripture of truth is coming, and that's going to be in 11 and 12, okay? And that's what we're going to talk about uh, next week. The scripture of truth basically is the Holy Spirit bringing the truth, okay? It's prophecy, which is history written in advance. He's going to take the things of Christ, reveal them, and unfold them, okay? Um, so to confirm or to conclude, I want to just say this. Never, ever get discouraged. Listen. The Lord hears our prayers the moment it comes out of our mouth. And I think speaking is so important. Yeah. Speak those prayers. And the Lord, when he hears those prayers, the answer is going out already. If you feel that there has been a delay, there is probably some real fighting going on. There really is. There's always spiritual warfare going on. Okay, where's all the spiritual warfare? Between heaven and earth, between God and Satan, between Christ and Satan, between the holy angels and the fallen angels, and between the church and the kingdom of darkness, okay? Now, it might take some time for this angelic warfare to be accomplished, but never, ever doubt the answer is on the way and it will be in the right time because God is sovereign and you belong to him. God is in control. He rules over all creation and creatures, okay? Remember, from our point of view, it, it doesn't look like faith and facts line up, but you have to walk in faith. You have to walk in truth. It will require faith, but remember, it is the angels that do the fighting. It is the saints that do the praying and warring in the spirit. What's the key to warring in the spirit? That's a real good key. What's a key every day to be warring in the spirit? Hmm? Praying. Pray how? Praying in the spirit. There you go. Spiritual language. That is so much more powerful. If you guys can imagine, use your imagination to know what's going on. And all of a sudden now, we, the temple, where the Holy Spirit resides in us, starts speaking the words that penetrates right through mm -hmm. any conflict. Boom! And that's what it goes. It is so powerful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Use that every single day. Okay? Every day. The focus is not the angels. The focus is the Lord Jesus Christ being over all, but he does give us knowledge of the angels' work. They're fighting. We don't even pray for them. We pray Lord's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? Amen. Okay, that prepares us then for next week to start getting into, I don't know how long, 11 or 12. We'll just take it slow.